Welcome everybody to our bioengineering seminar series. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Dr. Sandeep uh, Gopalakrishnan. Uh, Sandeep is an assistant professor and directs the Biobehavior Research Lab in the College of Nursing at UWM. And he's an active member of McPherson Eye Research Institute at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to joining uh, UWM, Sandeep was a postdoc fellow in the lab, uh, lab of Dr. David Harder at the Cardiovascular Center Medical College of Wisconsin, where his research focused on identifying the role of autoregulation in cerebral blood flow. Uh, for the doctoral studies at UWM, uh, he investigated the use of near-infrared photons in the treatment of retinal injury, retinal degenerative diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, under the guidance of Professor Janice Els. And his current research involves developing and translating novel therapeutic st uh, strategies to improve wound healing. Sandeep is going to give a talk on light-based technologies in wound care. Sandeep, please. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Sure. So if you can, if, when you heard that introduction, you can see that the career trajectory has moved from one area of research to other to other. But the inter interesting as well as fascinating thing is that there are a lot of overlapping, uh, see overlapping, uh, overlapping research themes to that basic uh, switch from one area to the other. So today, what I want to discuss is basically the significance of chronic non-healing wounds and some of the interventions that are currently in place, some of the disadvantages in the, in the context of a, a clinical practice. And as a bioengineering um, student, what are some of the inputs that you can bring into the page in developing novel interventions uh, in and around chronic non-healing wounds? So the title, as you can see, is a light-based uh, technologies in wound care. And we will slowly go in there before even we start there. As you know, the skin is a very intact barrier, and those who have taken classes in immunology knows that it's a very integral part of your innate immune system, providing you the barrier function. And you can see the stratification pattern. And the reason why I'm mentioning these slides is because of the significance of uh, different layers involved in wound formation as well as wound pathogenesis. So as you can see, it's a highly stratified layer. And I don't want to go into the depth of the anatomical characterization of this uh, organ. And again, this is one of the largest organ systems in your body. So very fascinating way structures or cells are aligned in a unique fashion. And there is a lot of uh, key players in this particular uh, cellular pool. As you can see, the keratinocytes play a significant role. The Langerhans cells, which are again uh, part of the immune cells, play a significant role. So you can read through all the unique cell types that play a significant role. And again, blood vessels. So as you would go deeper to the um, skin layers, you have the blood vessels playing an, in, in, a significant role as well. And, uh, the, and again, it's really interesting to know the immunological perspective of this particular structure as well, because with time, the immune system, ha immune system has been classified as a skin-associated lymphoid tissue as well, because there are a lot of autoimmune disorders that you can see on the skin surfaces, similar to psoriasis, various other uh, allergic hypersensitivity reactions, so on and so forth. So the skin being the largest organ in the body, obviously possesses an array of functions, acting as a barrier for protection. So it basically gives you a membrane that separates your internal environment from that of the external environment. And the interesting factor is that your skin is in constant crosstalk with whatever changes that is happening in the environment. For example, the temperature in the room is changing. For example, when you are holding your pizza, whenever, for example, when you are, uh, hold, when you are touching the surface of the uh, table that you are sitting, always the skin interacts with the physical, chemical, as well as the microbiome uh, phenotype of those surfaces, so on and so forth. So it's a really, really a fascinating structure. So, uh, and in the in a, as a physiological standpoint, it prevents dehydration and it acts as sensory thermoregulatory uh, organ as well. And when you live in geographical locations similar to this, significance of vitamin D and its corresponding role in 
your immune system as well as in generating various uh, autoimmune disorders are of huge, huge significance as well. So if you closely observe what are some of the uh, cellular events that can happen on the surface of the skin, for example, you have the keratinocytes on uh, basically on the top of the layer. So you can have UV radiations when you wash your hand with soap or when you, when you expose various molecules to your skin surface, it can be toxins, it can be irritants, it can be any, any molecules that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life. So wh whatever thing that is happening over here, you can see uh, if it is a noxious stimuli, or if it is a stimuli that can generate any sort of dangerous response, you can see tons of downstream signaling pathways that are kicked in and as a result of which you end up producing mechanisms that can alter various type of cellular phenotype as well or cellular properties with time as well. So and again I don't want to go into the complexities of those uh, downstream pathways. The overall theme here that I want to identify is that when you are exposed to a noxious or a dangerous stimuli, you end up producing uh, a cascade of signaling pathways, thereby a variety of cellular events are altered with time. So, and the problem of wound healing is presumably as old as mankind itself, right? So uh, during the evolutionary perspective, you have wounds happening all over the time during that evolutionary phases of your life. And as you can see, the need for surgical care of survivors of accidents or animal attacks during the early part of the evolution is part of the story of civilization. Correct? As it is the story of medical care of those wounded in that other peculiarly uh, human endeavor similar to that of warfare. So fighting each other. Correct? Having various type of physical interaction should have always created sort of situation similar to that of wounds. And obviously those wounds would have healed, those wounds wouldn't have healed. We don't know at this point of time. Correct? So but interesting factor is that the issues are re revolving around wounds are there uh, from the beginning of mankind itself. So the treatment of our wounds is an ancient art. So there are a lot of things that came into treating variety of wounds, constantly refined to reflect obviously improvements in the weapon technology, for example, the initial, for example, if 500, 600 years ago, the wounds that at that point of time was a concern was maybe a spare wound, right? A wound with a sharp object, but now it probably will be a bullet wound versus various other forms of sophistication that has come to it, that has emerged with the weapon technology. And the war transportation, the antiseptic practices, and various surgical techniques would have really, really revolutionized the way the individuals uh, have dealt with variety of wound during those processes. And the reason why I mentioned that was because immense uh, technologies that as uh, used in the field of military science or whatever it is that you can call has been translated to various civil, civilian emergency situations as well. So the developments in military trauma care for musculoskeletal injuries have greatly influenced civil, civilian emergency medicine, and again, and that's true with various other scientific disciplines as well. So the emerging technologies that have immediate application in the field of um, military science down the road gets slowly translated to uh, civilian uh, environments. So traumatic injury, as you can see, is a leading cause of mortality in almost all geographic locations. And in addition to trauma, at this point of time, we are discussing in the context of trauma, you have millions of surgical wounds that are created annually in the course of routine medical processes, right? So tons of surgeries happens in the clinics all the time, and as a result of those surgical interventions, you are basically creating wound, right? You are basically creating a fine incision wounds in achieving the, a particular goal through that surgical process. Facilitating the healing of these unintended and deliberate injuries um, and minimizing the anesthetic. Also, these are some of the factors that I want to mention that can translate into the clinical practice at this point of time. And there can be variety of injuries, as you can see. You can have arterial ulcers, you can have sickle cell ulcers, or these are much more specific forms of injuries that you can see in the clinical practice. Post-operative wounds, a huge area, correct? Post-operative wounds, burns, Acute wounds, acute, for example, when you stumble upon a sharp object, are the acute wounds that you are getting over there. Pressure ulcers, a huge issue in nursing homes, especially in geriatric setups. You have 
pressure ulcers as a result of pressure forces directly interacting with your soft tissue on an extended period of time. And because of the immobilization that goes hand in hand with that, pressure ulcers, a huge um, clinical burden at this point of time. Chronic leg ulcers that can be from a diabetes background, that can be from any, any vascular abnormality background, all contribute to that. Venous insufficiency disorders, vascular abnormalities that is accumulating with time. So whatever type of wound that we are discussing over here, it has huge economic burden that goes hand in hand with, um, with, the, with the public health scenario as well. And studies around wound as well as wound healing is being uh, there using various animal models. So you can see a few examples of animal models over here. The Drosophila model versus the chick model versus the mouse versus the zebrafish model. And again, most of the information that we know at this point of time with respect to various signaling pathways involved in human wound healing is derived from studies on rod and models, to be honest. And there are much more um, focus as well as emphasize at this point of time dealing with drosophilia as well as the zebrafish models because obviously you know that you can manipulate the, uh, the genotype of those uh, organisms pretty, uh, f very fast enough. They multiply faster so you can have much more a generational study with those type of organisms as well. So one of the mysteries in the field of tissue regeneration as well as repair is the heterogeneity among diverse organisms, right? So again, there is no quote-unquote model at this point of time that exactly reflects what is happening in the human beings until or unless you basically do the experimentation in the human population. So the closest model at this point of time is the swine model or the pig model, which the reason is because of the nature of the uh, tissue as well as the stratification it has that closely matches with that of the human uh, skin. Um, as you can see, uh, the heterogeneity is a huge issue at this point of time. And some organisms perfectly regenerate in your tissues and organs, correct? There are a lot of organisms <laughs> that perfectly regenerate. Many of the reptile, reptile uh, organisms basically regenerate at a faster rate as well. Whereas others replace the damaged tissue by pathological. So in, in, in the process of repairing, you can have dysfunction that goes hand in hand with that, correct? You can have a perfect replacement of the tissue that is damaged, or you will be replacing the tissue that is damaged with a scar tissue as well. Or a, a, an abnormal tissue that is formed as a result of that um, regenerative process. So in humans, perfect tissue regeneration has only been described in the fetal skin. So all the postnatal skin injuries will end up producing some sort of scar tissue until or unless it's, it is a damage in the brain. Correct? If it's an injury in the brain, you generally don't produce scar tissue. But apart from that, all postnatal wounds at this point of time will create some sort of, some sort of remnant, remnant tissue phenotype that goes hand in hand with that. A few examples are mentioned over here. So for example, the linear hypertrophy scar after a midline sternotomy, for example, if you are doing cardiothoracic surgeries, and if you are, if you are basically uh, cutting your rib cage out, which is technically the sternotomy, you end up producing scars similar to this. B is not, nothing but a scar from a burn injury. And on the right panel, you are seeing a hypertrophied uh, scar formation, which is something known as a, a keloid formation as a result of a presternal folliculitis. So these are some of the outcomes that you can expect as a result of wound healing process as well. And even if you notice the wounds in your hands or in your legs or in your body at some point of time that has happened before, you can see a, a remnant of that in your, in, your, uh, in your body landmarks, right? So that is very, very interesting with respect to human wound, wound uh, regeneration as well as healing. So demographically, as you can see, the number of patients suffering from chronic wounds and impaired healing conditions is reaching epidemic uh, proportions or numbers. And the reason is because of the underlying physiological reasons contributed by diabetes to begin with. And again, the, the, the epidemic nature of uh, diabetes and various other vascular abnormalities are obviously contributing to that huge numbers that you are seeing over there. So few uh, clinically uh, common Presentations are mentioned over here. You have venous leg ulcers. You have the diabetic foot ulcers or DFUs, obviously seen in uh, chronic uh, 
uh, diabetes situations where you have uncontrolled diabetes for an extended period of time that progresses to various type of neuropathies. And when you step on hard objects or sharp objects or warm objects or cold objects, you generally don't feel that sensation because of that neuropathy. So when you have diabetes today, you don't get chronic wounds tomorrow. It happens over, 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 over an extended period of time as a result of uncontrolled hyperglycemia that goes hand in hand that leads to a final neuropathic situation. Correct? Infections that goes hand in hand with diabetic foot ulcers, very commonly seen uh, clinical phenotype over here. As a result of which, you can even have foot deformity. I don't want to put very complex as well as scary images over here. You can have various type of deformities that is happening to these extremities as well. Hypertrophic scars, as you can see in the lower panel over here. Arterial ulcers as a result of vascular abnormalities, as well as either it can be an end result of an acrotic or an ischemic event that is going in that uh, vessel-related uh, anatomy. Pressure source, another very fascinating pathology you can see when you are immobilized for an extended period of time and the soft tissue pressure interactions basically drive the path. And again, all these uh, wounds are graded in various scales. You can have a grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, which basically tells you the type of clinical trajectory of that particular uh, clinical picture as well. Then we have Killard, which again is a reflection of what you are seeing over here. Um, and it, 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 it can be from a constant growth. It can be, as you can see, because as a result of regeneration, the tissue is exaggerating the response, right? As a result of which you have extra tissue that is formed over here, which is the chili. Correct? You have an exaggerated response to, and again, it depends upon your uh, other immune factors, the type of wound, the layers of skin involved in that process, your genotype, your environmental interaction, so on and so forth. So the wound care awareness uh, is a really, really important thing. So as you can see some of the frequencies and stats over here, it's a huge public health burden though, especially in the geriatric world, it's a huge public health issue. So in the US alone, more than six million people are afflicted with chronic wounds, which is replacing a major, which is placing a major burden on the healthcare systems. So you can see the dollar numbers over here, dollar 50 billion, more than many common cancers together. So it, it is, a, it, in a public health perspective, it, even though it is less seen, when, when you hear cancer versus a wound, you generally don't feel that significant, significance of those numbers with respect to a wound, but it is a huge, huge public health issue. So 15% of all diabetic patients are uh, supposed to end up having a diabetic foot ulcer at some point of time in their life. So millions are newly diagnosed every year with diabetes. So obviously, you can expect the number of chronic non-healing wounds with uh, diabetic foot ulcers with time as well. And especially as a result of the DFUs, you end up having amputations. That goes with disability. That goes with your work times away from your uh, productive years, so on and so forth. That again contributes as well as uh, accelerates the economic burden associated with that. So from there, let's see what are some of the fascinating features associated with wound healing. So wound healing after skin injury involves obviously extensive communication between different cellular uh, constituents that we have discussed in our earlier slides, right? So you have stratification, you have a variety of unique cells in various layers and unique properties associated with that layers as well. So obviously when you are having an injury, whatever may be the injury, when you are having an injury, there should be immediate crosstalk between various players in that particular anatomy that should uh, communicate with the rest of your uh, immune system in a physiological manner, thereby many, many uh, players come into that particular site to basically quench that response. So different cellular constituents of the diverse compartments of the skin and obviously the extracellular matrix, right? The matrix that basically holds all these structures together. It can be collagen, it can be various other extracellular matrix components. So in a normal physiological condition, restoration of function, functional epithelial barrier is highly efficient. So if you are, if you are having a normal physiology and if you are having a wound, you are expected to have a complete wound closure or a complete wound healing happening with X amount of time. Correct, it depends upon the wound depth, it depends upon the wound area, it depends upon the other characteristics of the wound. But you are expecting to have a healing event at some point of time after that particular insult. Correct, but when you are having various type of 
underlying uh, pathologies similar to that of uh, vascular abnormalities. And again, I am re-emphasizing the significance of diabetes or hyperglycemia over here. You start screwing up everything. And, you, and the discussion revolves around other things as well. So uh, the, the normal wound uh, related or wound healing mechanisms are mentioned over here. You have early stages where you have hemostasis, you have inflammation that goes along with proliferation. I think I have one more slide for it. And finally, you basically have the remodeling events happening. Correct remodeling that basically will replace whatever tissue that has been damaged with the complete functionality. Then only you can say that you basically remodel that. Correct, when you're remodeling your kitchen, when you're tearing down things and putting new things in, that should replace the function that was initially attributed to that particular structure that was remodeled, right? So similar to that, you can see early events, intermediate events, as well as late events. And finally, as a result of the late event, you basically end up producing the remodeling of that issue. And again, this uh, discussions are really highly variable depending upon the depth of the layers are in, that are involved, the area that is involved, and again, the superseding infections that is involved, uh, so on and so forth. I'm thinking about normal physiology, not even in the context of any pathology that goes hand in hand with that. Correct? So with a normal physiological background, you can even expect these events to have variability depending upon the various factors that we have discussed. So some of the importance, so hemostasis is nothing but when whenever you have a wound, the capillaries are involved or the bigger blood vessels are involved. So the initial response is to shut down those blood vessels, correct? So you have hemostasis, which goes hand in hand with your coagulation cascade, platelets, various, various other coagulation cascade molecules, so on and so forth. So think about platelet abnormalities, coagulation abnormalities that can contribute to an altered hemostasis. So that is a different, physiolo a different uh, physiological background. Correct? So you basically shut down the blood supply in that particular location. The reason is because if, if you don't shut down the, the environmental interaction that expose that wound to bacteria or viral material can have easy access towards to your bloodstream, which, is, which becomes very complex with time. Correct? You end up having septicemia, so on and so forth. Correct? You don't want that to happen. So obviously, the, the mother nature has given a, given a fascinating mechanism by which you immediately shut down the events that is creating the leak of fluid from that side. Then obviously the inflammatory components kicks in as a result of, and obviously in this particular context, inflammation is a useful thing, correct? The inflammation driven proliferation and remodeling versus in some context, if you can discuss inflammation that drives pathology. But in this particular case, inflammation is, even though driving the wound pathology, it is in, in a good side versus in a bad side. Correct? You can drive inflammation over here, and there are tons of inflammatory players. Cells are there, inflammatory mediators are there, there can be molecules, it can be various other significant uh, events that is happening over there. And as a result of these events happening, the cells proliferate. Correct? The cells start multiplying aggressively. Why? The cells multiply to replace the damaged tissue. So you basically proliferate. Cells start multiplying vigorously to proliferate. And finally, you basically remodel. So you can, in the context of diabetic foot ulcer or in various pressure ulcers, you can see all these events are one way or other compromised. Some, some events may be compromised in a higher fashion when compared to the other, but these steps are all screwed up one way or other. So hemostasis versus inflammation, proliferation and remodeling are really, really fascinating steps that drive these processes. So this is in the context of a normal physiology. So what happens when you are having chronic wound? So when I say chronic wound, these are wounds that never heals. Correct? That's why they are chronic. Correct? They stay for in, your, in your anatomical landmarks for an extended period of time. It's really, really hard to heal. And the reason why they are really, really hard to heal is because of the interruption in the normal wound healing process that we have seen. Right? can obviously develop into uh, chronic wounds, as we have seen. It can be DFU, it can be venous ulcers, it can be uh, pressure ulcers, whatever we have discussed in that particular diagram uh, a few slides back, right? And uh, the factors can, be, uh, factors can be an issue with hemostasis. Factors can be an issue with inflammatory mediators playing there. Factors can be an issue with proliferation as well as the final remodeling. 
So any of these events can be screwed up or compromised. Right? That is the fascinating thing that happens with the uh, chronic phones. And obviously, you can see, as we have mentioned in our earlier slide, the initial events or the crosstalk between the cell populations that dictates or that basically informs the rest of your physiological system to function in a unique way. Correct? So, for example, when platelets are, platelets are increasingly recruited to a particular site, your body should know that. Correct? When the platelets are recruited to a particular site, your body, for example, if you are having a large burn, if you are having a larger burn when, when compared to the diabetic foot ulcers, you need to have much more elaborate recruitment of immune cells and various cells. And again, that depends upon a wound with an area A versus A square versus A cube, whatever may be the dimension that we are discussing over there. Correct? So it be based upon the extensive nature of the wound, you will have different players as well as different, uh, different issues with respect to that crosstalk as well. So crosstalk is altered over here. You start producing uh, lack of migration or proliferation. So when, you, when the cells proliferate, when they start multiplying, they migrate as well. Correct? When they, mig they migrate as well. And again, that can be discussed in the context of migration of inflammatory cells as well. From the blood vessels, they extravasate to that particular site. When I say extravasation, they basically leave the blood vessels and reaches that particular site to deal with the injury in cells. Correct? So those type of events can happen over there as well. Um, and again, you can have obviously superseded events similar to that of bacterial colonizations. Correct? Bacterial colonization leading to biofilm formations. And biofilm are again a huge issue with respect to chronic wounds because uh, it is really, really hard to treat uh, infections that has biofilm phenotype associated with that as well. So the overall goal is to say that we discussed the normal wound healing process. Now we are discussing a chronic non-healing wounds and some of the uh, cellular players over there. And as you can see, the diabetes, uh, uh, diabetes foot ulcers are again really fascinating because as a result of uncontrolled hyperglycemia for an extended period of time, you end up producing neuropathy. Correct? It can be motor neuropathy or sensory neuropathy, or it can be even autonomic neuropathy. Correct? It can, you end up creating neuropathy in your peripheral sites and starts, for example, if you're at this point of uh, anatomical contact with the physical environment, you start producing callus. The callus will be much more resistant to any sort of uh, physical interaction. So when you have uh, subcutaneous hemorrhage over there, you generally don't notice that. You, even when you step on uh, a warm object or a cold object or a sharp object, you will not be able to identify that, and as a result of which you propagate that foot ulcer uh, situation. Correct? And on the right panel, what I'm trying to do here is to uh, compare and contrast in a genotypic fashion what are some of the uh, characteristic changes that happens in a non-healing wound phenotype versus a healing wound phenotype. So you can see, and again, this is a microarray, uh, microarray representation of some of the upregulated as well as downregulated genes that happens with the non-healing phenotype versus a healing phenotype. Is that clear? So characteristic cellular genetic events are happening in a non-healing wound, which is uh, really, really a uh, clinical burden at this point of time. So what are some of the basic tenets of wound care? So you basically have patient assessments, you do the wound assessment by, you have to diagnose what type of wound it is, whether it's a DFU or a venous ulcer or a, any sort of uh, pressure ulcer, post-surgical wound, so on and so forth. You understand the etiology behind that. Is there a neurological component involved? Is there a vascular component involved? Is there an infection that goes hand in hand with that, so on and so forth? Whether there are structural deformities that is happening as a result of that wound. So the, the, the basic wound care, uh, wound care techniques at this point involves something known as debridement. So the wound is not healing or the wound is not closing because the, the, the cells on the margin of that wound which is supposed to heal are all dead. Correct? As a result of which you don't have a chance to merge because all those cells are dead. So debridement is nothing but removing or basically scraping off those and depends upon the nature of the wound basically scraping off those dead cells so that the underlying cells which are viable or active can replace the one that is damaged so that is the whole 
a mechanism behind deep right So you go to the clinic, won't clean, you, they basically clear it or deep it. Correct? So debridement is one way, so or you can prepare the wound bed with and various type of antiseptics, antibiotics, various type of uh, solutions, so on and so forth. Offloading or compression, you reduce the pressure related to that particular site by offloading. Various type of therapeutic agents can be used. And again, if it is really, really complex, you end up creating surgical interventions as well. So time principles of wound bed preparations are over here, which is basically dependent upon what type of tissue, the type of infection as well as inflammatory response, whether how moist the wound is, the moisture, balance, imbalance, nature, as well as the edge characteristics of the wound. So if you see, I've seen a chronic wound, you will be able to identify what, uh, what are the things that I'm trying to explain here in that particular context. So what are some of the current strategies that is in place for in the context of therapy? So with respect to a wound as here, you have defective stem cells, high level of reactive oxygen species, inflammatory cytokines are really, really upregulated. It can be of low-grade infection, it can be without low-grade infections. Proteases, again proteases because of the cells that are replacing the normal cellular phenotype over there. Altered growth factors in that side, that's why growth, hormone, growth factors, similar to that of epidermal growth factors are used for chronic non-healing wound uh, interventions. So growth factors as well as extracellular metric degradation products. Lack of growth factor and again ECM. Uh, senescent cells, the cells that are remaining silent. They are not proliferating out. Impaired cell functions, even the cells are proliferating, they can't function the role that the cell was doing before. Lack of vasculature as a result of which you can drive hypoxic events at that site. So all these are the net result of a, or, 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 or in other words, all are the, these are the events that basically drives the chronic non-healing wound. So you can target any of these events. So you can use antioxidants, you can use anti-inflammatory agents, antibacterial protease inhibitors, Inhibitors against growth, uh, various type of proteases to protect uh, growth factors. So we don't want to have the growth factors degraded by proteases. So all those type of interventions. Obviously, growth factor by itself can be used. Uh, recruit active cells in the place of senescent cells. Inhibition of uh, uh, inflammation, thereby you, uh, start you start decreasing or quenching the reactive oxygen species of that particular site and the angiogenic factors, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of avenues for intervention, correct? There are a lot of avenues for intervention, understanding what are some of the cellular events that is happening uh, underlying to this particular uh, pathology. So all those greens are always targets for, so you can have a novel antioxidant molecule that can be used, a one that is co commonly seen in the literature at this point of time are uh, various nanoparticles or various type of nanoparticles conjugated to various other modulators that can be used for this particular purpose as well. So wound care technologies, and again, this is really significant in the context of a bioengineering perspective as well because there are a lot of bilayered skin equivalents that is in practice at this point of time. An example of that is something known as an uh, Apple graph, and there are multiple other commercially available products. So you can see you are basically trying to graft a skin tissue which is exactly similar to that of a human skin. So these are all live layers, correct? You basically have bioengineering scaffolding events happening over here over which you basically uh, implant cells and basically grow that cells, thereby they technically looks like that of a human skin. So these are the histological sections from that. Technically, te it looks pretty much same. Only thing is that when you place them on the individual who is having chronic wounds, it should integrate with that. Correct, it should integrate. So integration is still an issue, but these type of tools are available, and these type of tools emerge because of bioengineering uh, faculties like you. Correct? So it is a really, really fascinating area, and you can load various drugs to it, you can load various other molecules to it, so on and so forth. So my, my uh, discussion today uh, is a little bit different from what we have discussed so far. Our goal is to discuss something known as the light therapy for, or the low-level laser or low-level light therapy for uh, chronic non-healing wounds. And again, you know the light therapy situation is there or the use of light as a therapeutic modality is being there for time immemorial. So you can see individuals using uh, light as a 
uh, source of healing for uh, various purposes in various civilizations. And pretty much you are pretty much familiar about this electromagnetic spectrum. With respect to the therapeutic approach, there are two windows over here. One is at the far red or the uh, near infrared range versus that of the blue wavelengths that are mainly used for decreasing the uh, biofilm burden as well as the infectious burden of the wound. So different wavelengths are being used by or played by different investigators depending upon what type of purpose you are expecting over there. So even when you use uh, low level light therapies, you can use a laser source versus an LED source. And probably you know these, the difference between these better than me. So monochromaticity, coherence, collimation, so on and so forth are some of the characteristic features that differentiates a laser beam versus that of an LED so light source. And it is being extensive and based on, in, in the context of light therapy, both LED as well as lasers are equally used for various purposes. So what I'm trying to discuss here is something known as an near-infrared photobiomodulation. So you can see that vocabulary, photobiomodulation. You are modulating cellular effects using photons. When I say modulating, you are either increasing a particular function of a cell or decreasing the particular function of a cell. So you are modulating the cellular functions using light energy. So in this particular case, we are using near-infrared photons. So it is a low energy photon irradiation by monochromatic light in the particular range over there. And it can, be it can be achieved by using laser sources versus that of LED light sources. And as a result of this irradiation, you can have tissue repair happening. You can quench the inflammatory response. You can have an altered profile for pain. You can alter edema. You can have uh, various type of uh, pain-related profile treated for this uh, treated using this modality. Is that directly affecting transcription factors? Yeah, that's, that's the whole point. So we'll see that in one of the next, one of the slides in the, uh, one of the slides coming after this. So as a result of low level light therapy, you end up having, you end up altering the uh, cellular apoptosis, proliferation, migratory events, as well as the ability of the cell to attach one, one to other. So these are some of the factors that are either upregulated or downregulated. It can happen both ways. So either upregulated or downregulated as a result of it. So the, the reason why, and this is not a new science, this has been there for many decades at this point of time, and the reason why you are able to use light as a source to modulate the cellular function is because you have photoacceptors in various cellular compartments. And one widely accepted photoacceptor is cytochrome oxidase of your electron transport chain. So cytochrome oxidase is an established photoacceptor in that particular near infrared range. And these are being proved by various emission, absorption emission spectral studies using isolated uh, cytochrome oxidase and irradiating that with light and getting the peaks on and so forth. So you generally get peaks based upon, as you can see over here, you can see, you can get peaks in that particular range as well as you can have altered activities on and so forth. So the, the goal here is that cytochrome oxidase is a very, at this point of time again, very well established photoacceptor molecule for this particular wavelength that we are discussing over here. And again, I'm not going into the details of the uh, cellular mechanisms over here. There are copper A, copper B centers that shuttle electrons, which in, 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 in direct, indirectly affects the uh, electron transport chain, thereby ATP generation is upregulated. ATP by itself is a signaling molecule. You start producing more free radicals. Free radicals itself is a signaling molecule that can Go, in, go downstream to affect various other signaling pathways as well. That is again described over here. The question over there was whether it affects the gene transcription. Obviously, yes. There are a lot of literature evidence that basically explains the uh, upregulation of various transcriptomes depending upon what you are basically investigating over there. So the gene transcription events happen uh, as a result of the photons interacting with the cytochrome oxidase. And on the right panel, what you are seeing again, gene, ex uh, gene expression, various transcription factors similar to that of NF-kappa-B, AP1, so on and so forth, basically dictating these processes. And again, as, as I have discussed before, ATP by itself can be a signaling molecule within the cell. Free radicals can be a signaling molecule within the cell. These are all outcomes of an exposed event to this particular wavelength that is happening. And again, interestingly, you basically have an optical window with a much more broader interaction with that of the 
physiological molecules. You can see a window over there where there is much more absorbance that is happening for that particular wavelength. So this is a range. This is not an exact wavelength that you can pick. And there are individuals who pick exact wavelength to work with their hypothesis. But my personal thought is that it's a range that basically functions to achieve this goal. And again, tissue penetration is again a huge issue. So these days, low-level light therapy is being extensively used for transcranial applications. Transcranial applications for dementia, <coughs> various type of uh, traumatic injuries, so on and so forth. And there are a lot of very well-established publications out there that basically, uh, that basically explains the uh, clinical outcomes in a positive way because of irradiation transcranially. So it has to penetrate the a skull and basically reach a certain compartments of the brain to basically achieve that particular goal. And there are fMRI studies, there are various other fascinating imaging studies that goes hand in hand with that. So you can see the de depth of penetration as well as some of the events that is happening as a result of this exposure as we have discussed in the context of wound healing exclusively. You have extracellular matrix production happening or the collagen synthesis happening. Uh, matrix metalloproteases plays a significant role. You alter the vascular perfusion. You decrease apoptosis. You, uh, you, uh, cause, you cause the proliferation of fibroblasts as well as keratinocytes, so on and so forth. So all the things that we have discussed earlier that leads to a step-by-step step, step by step mechanism uh, of wound healing will be affected in one way or other. I'm not absolutely saying that when you flashlight, everything is going to happen. That's not the case here. Certain events are upregulated, certain events are downregulated, and again, everything depends upon the dosage of the light itself. So similar to pharmaceutics, it's like a pharmaceutical approach. So similar to the uh, pharmaceutical molecules, you have a biphasic response curve, the Arnold shoes law that probably you, would have, you are familiar as well. So similar to that, this has a biphasic curve to that particular uh, event as well. So similar to pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals are highly, highly of uh, clinical significance at this point of time. So the one, the device that we prob mostly use are something known as a warp device. And again, this is a NASA spin-off, uh, pr uh, probably a few decades back. And this is manufactured by a company in Barnville, Wisconsin. So you can see the uh, wavelength specification as well as the characteristics of the spectral power and output from this particular diagram. And the reason why we, are, we initially started using is because we had access to it. And through my mentor, I had access to through it. So it's a hereditary, an event that got passed from uh, one mentor to the other. So I will wrap up the discussion here by showing some of the clinically relevant publications out that basically, so don't get scared. These are much more simpler forms of wounds. So wounds get really bad. Wound gets really, really bad. So these are very simple forms of wounds very simple nature or phenotypes of wounds that you can see. But in a clinical practice, you see much more worse situation. So you can, in, in the left panel, what you are seeing is a wound that has been treated by the wavelength used here is 632. You can see that there is a, a difference from the wavelength that we have discussed before. And obviously, I believe in the range rather than picking a particular wavelength. Uh, you can see the wound getting healed with time and the corresponding wound, wound, wound ulcer area plot over there. And on the right panel, what you are seeing is the control arm. Correct? This is just from an example uh, from a particular study that got published uh, in 2015. So we did a uh, pilot study based upon a CTSI grant. Actually, my mentor was the lead author in, the, in that particular study. Uh, the, the issue here was that when you are having spinal cord injuries, the innervation to your extremities are compromised, right? So when your in innovations are compromised, you end up having a profile similar to that of neuropathy, because you don't have sensation. You are in the wheelchair to begin with, but again, you don't have sensation in your extremities. As a result of which, when you are having a wound, it will never heal, because sensation is required for wound healing purpose as well. If you don't have sensation, the wound is not going to heal at any given point of time. So these individuals or these highly, um, uh, highly uh, uh, served uh, veterans who are coming back from various war zones will end up having uh, diabetic, uh, sorry, uh, foot ulcers in their extremities. And we treated them with light, as you can see over there. Uh, and with the, with the light treatment, what we are able to demonstrate was that there is a significant decrease in the wound area. And this will be out in publication pretty soon. We are 
finalizing some of the wound fluid analysis as well. And the reason why I mentioned this particular study is to emphasize the fact that uh, this is entirely different from diabetic foot ulcers. So this is a, this is a chronic non-healing wound that happens in spinal cord injured veterans. And we did this study at the VA over here. So the, uh, from, from our study over here, we are demonstrating the fact that uh, the healing is m very much accelerated in these uh, clinical situations as well. And again, there are multiple other uh, studies out there which basically explains the signaling pathways involved. And again, very, depending upon your area of interest, you start looking at a particular signaling pathway, but there are thousands of pathways that can be investigated in that particular context. So this is basically explaining or this publication that came out this year, and again, this just got published, basically ex was looking at the JAK-STAT pathway, probably you are familiar about that pathway, and you can see an upregulation, so activated STAT propagates extracellular signals for gene transcription leading to cell proliferation as well as migration. So this wavelength that they used was like 660, and again, the, and again it's a huge debate with respect to the photobiomodulation field as well, what exactly the, so the individual who use 670, 660 will claim that that is the one that works. The individual who use 661 will claim that that is the one that basically works. So it, there is huge debate that revolves around it. And obviously the dosage associated with it, the duration that goes hand in hand with the dosage, all needs to be much more characterized in a particular clinical setting. So uh, you can see the uh, JAK as well as STAT pathway is uh, altered in this particular case, creating, uh, ex um, creating a loop of epidermal growth factor as well as epidermal growth factor receptor uh, mechanisms, thereby the healing is made at a faster rate. Because it basically reflects the epidermal, for example, if you are introducing or if you are, um, uh, if you are basically introducing epidermal growth factor into a wound, the wound, wound technically should supposed to heal faster because that's a growth hormone. So not a growth hormone, growth factor. Is that clear? So there are many other growth factors that can be used in that practice as well. So before I conclude, there are some future directions that we plan to move ahead as well. So using various, and again, uh, zebra fish model for wound healing is pretty new. The uh, drosophilia model for wound healing is pretty new. For, so depending upon the available resources we have, we plan to do more investigations, understanding the cellular mechanisms using newer animal models. Dosage characterization, very important in the field. There are a lot of things that need to be characterized with the dose. And again, that is true with the source as well, whether you are using a laser source versus that of a LED light source. Immunology of wound healing is again really, really a complex area to look. And again, novel light-related interactions or technologies. When, when I am preparing for this particular talk, I could see that there are, there are novel, um, novel films as well as uh, products similar to that of creams that you can use, which can be excited photodynamically with particular wavelength of light. And we obviously need larger clinical trials, and I have immense interest in using various uh, scaffolding materials similar to that of nanofibrous scaffolds, nanomaterials, especially tagging nanomaterials to various uh, growth factors and immune modulators that can uh, alter the profile of healing in those wounds. Um, nanomaterials are a huge area that I am really interested in. It. We can, you can basically tag nanomaterials with growth factors, so that goes hand in hand. And obviously, when you want to deliver a material, you need a scaffold, scaffold to an extent. So na various type of scaffolds can be used for achieving that particular goal as well. So there are a lot of plans that we are, and we, 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 we do a lot of experiments together as well. So mo most of the experiments are uh, performed at the level of rodent animal models, even though we do cl clinical trials in humans as well. But we want to elaborate the sample size, we want to increase the type of uh, uh, animal models that we are using for our studies as well. So with that, I will uh, conclude my discussion, and if you have any questions, I will take questions from here. Thank you, sir. No, sure. This was a fascinating oh, thanks. Talk. Uh, if there are questions, I can pass the microphone. Yeah, sure. Okay. Just curious. Uh, what type of wounds can be healed with this uh, uh, light therapy techniques? What type of wounds? Mm -hmm. So, when, when you say what type of wounds, so, so those publications that are out are all chronic non healing wounds. Correct? When I say chronic non-healing wounds, those are wounds that is 
not going to heal in a normal fashion. Correct? They stay there. And because of the comorbid issues that goes hand in hand with that, if you are not taking care of it, it will never heal. So that he wound will stay there and it becomes larger and larger and larger. Finally, you have to cut your leg. Uh, I mean, in terms of intensity of the wound. So it can be of, oh, if, if you, you are asking how. How serious. How serious. Mm -hmm. It can be used for like the minor wounds versus any sort of complex wound topology that you can expect as well. Mm -hmm. if, if it is a really large wound in your um, anterior or posterior area, large surface area, you can, and again, it depends upon the surface area that you are available, that you have available with respect to the light source as well. Mm -hmm. So that again is a challenging thing, designing a larger uh, light source for achieving this particular goal. And just one more question mm -hmm. that I have, I'm curious about. So for the um, pressure ulcer, diabetic pressure ulcer, which steps of the uh, wound process is more it's affected? Compromised. So with the, with the uh, diabetic, foot, so diabetic foot ulcers and PRU or pressure ulcers are two different things, right? And it can go hand in hand as well. You can have diabetes and can get pressure ulcers. That's a different story. Versus you can have diabetes foot ulcers by itself or pressure ulcers by itself. So to have pressure ulcers, first of all, most of the time you are immobilized. You are in bed for an extended period of time. So what steps are involved in the, the hemostasis versus inflammation versus proliferation? With the diabetes foot ulcers, almost all events are compromised. Pressure ulcers also, almost all events are compromised. You start compromising all those events that we have discussed in a stepwise step fashion that leads to chronic wound. So you can't say that this is because of, and again, there are disorders just because of hemostasis of irregularity or just because of inflammation of irregularity. But the point here is that if one is done, the other things also fall off. Thank you. Right? Mm -hmm. Just a second. Oh, I, I mean, I probably don't need it. Yep. Uh, it's for the Sure, sure, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Um, have you guys, do you have data on uh, how this kind of affects like subcutaneous wounds for like post-surgery or, you know, like deep cuts, gashes and things like how like the scar tissue formation yeah, you, is different? Yeah, like, we, we, we haven't or? done that by ourselves, but if you read the literature, there are tons of evidence for it. Okay. So there is like a substantial like difference in like Got the it. amount of scarring that Got formed. It. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks. It's really interesting. So if you heal with less scarring, that's a big thing. Right. If you are healing a wound with a relatively lower scarring rate, that's a big thing as well. And again, I'm not discussing, and there are a lot of other areas that are of huge significance in your particular context as well, novel biomaterials, novel biomaterials loaded with various biological molecules, nanomaterials, again, a huge area that is of huge significance at this point of time. And so kind of that mixed with correct, some correct, of the photonics correct, plus correct, some correct. other things. And on top of all that, uh, another area that I'm re really curious about is to have exact measurements of wound topology. So the one that you are seeing here is the, an example of a very low-grade wounds. So if I show you the massive nature of the wounds, it's really hard to quantify the topology of the wound. And when we, when we discussed about wound healing process, it has to come out in a three-dimensional fashion, right? That has come out from inside out. So most of the time, if, if, even if you look at nearby wound clinics over here, you don't have a very reliable tool through which you basically get the, or you can gauge the characteristics of the wound. There are, there are commercial products out there, but really expensive to buy and use as well. So I have oh, a thank question. you very much. Yeah, sure. I have a question for you. So these wounds are very complex, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the characteristic of each is different. But like on average, the photobiomodulation would heal like in what percentage of the, these, uh, you know, uh, basically oh, wounds? What all, what all yeah, different like types? A, yeah, on, so, on so, average, and does it depend like on the dosage and the duration? You know, you mentioned that correct. there's always this mm -hmm. um, basically discussion, what type of uh, laser and what's the dosage and what's the, you know, uh, duration to use? But uh, is there like an average number out there that photobiomodulation is effective like 75% or 85% in terms of wound healing? Can you give us the number? So those type of numbers are probably out there, but I'm not uh, familiar about those numbers. So the question here is whether uh, if, if you have 10 different wounds, whether 
50 of 50 percentage of them can be healed versus yes. 75 percentage of right. them. I, I'm exactly not sure about the number out there. Probably there should be some numbers yeah. out there with respect to that. And the debate always revolves around, for example, if I'm an investigator who is using 670 versus another investigator who uses 660, he will, he or she will try to establish the fact that 660 works better than 670. But I I am always of the thought that it's a range rather than a rather than a particular wavelength yes. that does the magic over here. So, And when you are exposed to UV light, it's not the particular wavelength of UV that you are exposed to. It's a range of wavelength that you are exposed to that creates the physiological consequence of UV. Well, is there, is there, are there any publications talking about like that range and the effectiveness? Like, do you see a change in regulation from, you know, what is it? 10 nanometers? Is it oh, yeah, there, is it are, there are a lot of, Where is there are a lot of uh, com comparative wavelength studies that has been done as well. Okay. So uh, the okay. one that I, I thought of putting that as well. So one, th one study that w was uh, recently published was comparing, for example, a 630 versus 670 versus 810 versus 870, so on and so forth. So doing that particular, I should have put that. So, so doing that particular studies, they were able to have an uh, relative betterment with a particular wavelength when compared to that of the other. Probably because of that particular wavelength is much more uh, redundant in interacting with the uh, cytochrome oxidase, mm -hmm. uh, something like that would have been the basic reason for that. Those this type of studies are out there as well. Right. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. Oh, thank you very much. Sure.